Today we're talking about mail delivery, also known as the closest I've come to human interaction since the quarantine began. Rain, sleet, and snow cannot stop them, but another few weeks of the Trump administration might do the trick. So what's wrong with the United States Postal Service? Well, there are two degrees of problems. The first is systemic, because while Trump certainly isn't helping things, the last time an American sent a piece of mail, Netflix was still passing DVDs around the globe. Second is new management, who just replaced the hang in there posters with a why not let go one. So first let's talk about the system. The UPS is really what would happen if you decided to create a Frankenstein's monster of the worst part of private and public companies. Now imagine if there was a company that got no government funding, but, and hear me out, its prices and practices were also determined by Congress. The only time a congressman has ever made a good business decision is when they're insider trading. I've got another good idea for you too, a Ken Burns documentary for TikTok. Now the post office was originally given one huge advantage in America. They have a government approved monopoly on delivering letters across the entire company. In the days before delivering mail was just passing around pottery barn catalogs, that had quite the cachet to it. Stamps were good business as everything was fine. The problem is the rise of email and other electronic communication methods killed those profits. The new name of the game is delivering packages, and there is plenty of competition in that game. UPS, FedEx, and DHL are all passing these things around. Still, with all the packages floating around the country these days, that should not be a problem, right? Well, in a phrase I never thought I'd say, here's Trump to deepen the conversation. The handing out packages for Amazon and other internet companies and every time they bring a package, they lose money on it. Ooh, they're taking the movie pass path to success. So that's not a completely accurate statement. Contrary to Trump's claims, the postal service is not losing money when it delivers a package for Amazon or other companies. It can't. By law, the agency is barred from charging delivery prices below what it costs the agency to fulfill them. Now that statement doesn't actually mean as much as it sounds like, but we'll get back to that later. So they're legally mandated to have a successful business model. What went wrong? Well, while they make money on every service provided, it's not enough to outweigh the many massive operational costs not directly related to each sale. Blockbuster Video made money every DVD rental they made, but ended up getting block busted. To quote the recently ousted Postmaster General Megan J. Brennan, despite growth in our package business, our financial results reflect systemic trends in the marketplace and the effects of an inflexible legislatively mandated business model that limits our ability to generate sufficient revenue and imposes costs upon us that we cannot afford. Now, there's a word that jumps out at me when I read that quote, calling back to something I mentioned earlier. Legislatively mandated. Congress? How did you screw this one up? Well, first, people haven't touched post office pricing rules since W was still in office, and the amount of first class mail since then has plummeted. Prices are set with input from nearly everyone in Washington, except for the United States Postal Service. Up until 1970, the post office was funded by the government and rates were set exclusively by Congress. Unfortunately, with Congress at the helm, lobbyists controlled and lowered the prices, meaning that the mail was getting to be quite an expensive taxpayer subsidized venture. Realizing they weren't up to the task of saying no to lobbyists and properly pricing postage, Congress radically overswung and divorced the government entirely from funding the post office. That meant, sorry post office, you're now entirely on your own regarding funding. With that same legislation, Congress created a separate government agency, the Postal Regulatory Commission. Unfortunately, despite being an agency, they had very little agency. According to that same bill, Postage rates were to be reasonable and equitable, and rates for letters must be uniform, meaning that the postage paid bears no relation to how far the mail must travel. 
Magazines and other periodicals would get lower rates because of their educational, cultural, and scientific or informational value. Congress also said not-for-profits, state political parties, and various other groups also were given reduced postage. Basically, go compete on the open market. You have to make a profit for yourself. Oh, and also, give discounts to all of these people and make sure you treat everyone fairly. Hey, you can always count on your letter monopoly to offset all those losses. During the Bush administration, the amount they could charge for their monopoly letter service was capped at the rate of inflation, making this maybe the least profitable monopoly in history. At this point, the privilege of being the only ones to be able to deliver letters to everyone kind of felt like it was turning into a burden. We have to drive this where for the price of a stamp? The other big nail in the post office's coffin came in the same 2006 legislation inflation capping piece. Enter the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act, which was passed by the Republican-controlled Congress and signed into law by President George W. Bush. This act reformed the post office's pension system in a way that is as interesting as it is efficient. That is to say, not very. Basically, since 2006, the post office has had to set aside cash up front for the next 75 years of employee hires and retirements. That's locked up about $120 billion in operating cash. We can't guarantee we'll be able to afford to deliver that letter, but when the new hire Carl retires in 60 years, we can guarantee that he will be taken care of. It required the post office to calculate all of its retiree pension and healthcare costs for the next 75 years, including for people it hadn't even hired yet, and put away enough over the next 10 years to cover them. To put this in perspective, that'd be like you only working from age 18 to 28, and then expecting to live on that income until you were 103 years old. So a combination of a congressionally mandated business plan designed largely in the 70s and tying up more than $100 billion in preparation for the next 75 years of retirement has left some major problems for the post office. Don't worry though because who is that pulling up? Oh, it's Donald Trump and he's got a solution to our problems. His newest strategy is to eliminate overtime for hundreds of thousands of postal workers and say employees must adopt a different mindset to ensure the postal service's survival during the coronavirus pandemic. Now, when you eliminate post office overtime, that's not saying, all right, it's five o'clock, go home. That's saying, all right, it's five o'clock, oh, you didn't deliver these packages? Well, I guess they're not getting mailed today. Start your route over again tomorrow and see if you can get them done. The alarming part about this is not a two day delay in your Amazon Prime shipment, but rather a recent Veterans Affairs report that showed that people who ordered prescription drugs online were sometimes experiencing significant delays for that medication. Those delays are also alarming people about mail-in ballots because there are some pretty strict deadlines there. And if the post office delays picking up your ballot by, say, sometimes more than a week, it could end up getting postmarked after the election, even if you put it in days in advance. Now, this administration's other solution is to raise prices and really lean into the one saving grace of everyone being locked inside their houses. Skyrocketing package volumes, up 60 to 80% in May, has propped up the Postal Service's finances and staved off immediate financial calamity. Oh yeah, with everyone locked at home, how is a shipping company losing money? The post office, if they raise the price of a package by approximately four times, it'd be a whole new ball game. But they don't want to raise because they don't want to insult Amazon and they don't want to insult other companies perhaps that they like. This strategy has its pros and cons, starting with the fact that, unlike with letters, the postal service does have competition in the shipping arena. So if you quadruple your prices and FedEx triples their prices, now's a good time to start unfurling that white flag. Of course, the postal service has one ace up its sleeve that Mnuchin argues is going underutilized. They're obligated by their monopoly to go to every house every day, or at least up until a few weeks ago, 
to deliver letters. Now this makes them stand out as one of the best options for last mile deliveries. Think about it like a game of basketball. UPS and FedEx pass the ball down the court to the hoop, but hey, Postal Service is obligated to hang on to that hoop all day, so why not just hand them the ball and they'll gladly dunk it at a discount. They were there anyways. For major shippers, this beats having to drive to a bunch of random addresses as they can instead drop off packages at hubs for the Postal Service to deliver. According to Post Office spokesman David Rupert, especially in rural America, shippers such as FedEx and UPS and others have found it more economical to pay us to deliver packages. Of course, when someone finds it more economical to contract through you, it's hard to interpret that any other way than you're undercharging them. The thing is, there is a much lower cost for the post office deliveries because they were going that way anyways. So losing some of those contracts is pretty much just turning away free money. Trump seems to have identified this as an area where the post office could stand to do a bit more negotiating though. Of course, cutting overtime and charging slightly more for last mile deliveries is like being the guy in the Titanic saying, don't worry everyone, we can figure this out. Get me a bucket and I'm going to start bailing. The latest numbers coming in show that insolvency has been delayed from this September to next October. Yay, we're no longer running on empty, but the check engine light is still flashing. So what are the long term solutions? There are two schools of thought. You have the McKenzie consultant ideology, which I say literally because the post office hired a McKenzie consultant in 2010 and then took none of his advice. To paraphrase a paraphrasing of their suggestion, it came down to don't prefund retirement accounts, let the post office set market prices for stamps instead of those sweetheart deals mandated by Congress, and begin shutting down services like six day deliveries, delivery to people's doors instead of pickup hubs, and closing struggling post offices. These recommendations seem to be reflected by the actions of our current postmaster general. Maybe also don't hire expensive management consultants if you don't plan to change anything. You can have that one for free. Just saved you at least $100,000. On the other hand, you have the more liberal solutions. Starting with, just return the post office to its original pre-1970 incarnation as a straightforward government funded universal public service, rendering emails hit to mail revenue a moot question. Or you could turn the postal service into providing a public option for basic banking services, a move that would both bring in new revenue and give low income Americans an alternative to predatory lenders and such. Lastly, just end the pre-funded pension system. Yeah, everyone hates this system and a bill recently passed the House of Representatives with bipartisan support, 87 Republicans and 232 Democrats. It's just sitting on McConnell's desk now since February. Don't worry though, it has a bunch of other ignored legislation to keep it company. So that's the status of the post office. With delays like these, I'm half expecting Congress to start saying, yeah Americans, your stimulus check is definitely in the mail. What? You haven't gotten it yet? Alright, I'll look into it. Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I'd like to thank my patrons for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent nonpartisan news looking into the overlooked, join this growing list of exceptional individuals by clicking on that link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring. Give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw, and lastly, as always, thank you for watching.